Content Warning Thoughts of Death and Self-Destructive Tendencies It was a normal day at work for me. I went into the office, showed my badge to the receptionist. She didn't even look up at me while she waved me through. Honestly, we're kinda lucky not to have a breach here in the Garden City, but who knows how long that's gonna last. At my desk, while I finished up the specs on the new, new robotic body, one of our visitors passed me by. I didn't recognize them, but they were escorted by my boss, so clearly they were very important. The only reason I even noticed them was they had some kind of gross perfume. It smelled a lot like antiseptic and bug repellent. I almost gagged, but luckily enough I managed not to. While I prepared to send up my specs for Isaac's Industries, I got a message from my boss. He needed me to present the specs to him. Immediately. So I got my flash drive ready and headed into the meeting room. In it, I could see the visitor standing behind my boss while he sat at his laptop. The visitor smiled at me and ran their head hands across my boss's shoulders. Well, you have a presentation, they said to me. I nod and plugged in the flash drive. Well, I went over the specs to my boss with the visitor standing just behind him. Occasionally the visitor would ask a question and I would answer it promptly, remembering to always answer what someone was asking. Normally we have strict policies on what was or wasn't allowed to be shared, but my boss was sitting right there, not saying everything, so everything was clearly alright. After presenting everything and my presentation was the visitor clapped my shoulder. Thanks so much, sweetie. You've just made my day, they said, their eyes shining over their blue bandana. After they took my flash drive from my hand, they called out to the office. Hey, we have a dead body in here. Confused, I looked around. My boss was still sitting still and not saying anything, but he was clearly very much still alive. The visitor was also clearly alive, especially since they were shouting and moving. Since there was no one else in the conference room, which means that the dead body was me. Sure enough, when my coworkers crowded into the conference room, they began to crowd around me. A few were touching me and someone was calling the vanguard. Yeah, we have a dead body at work, about a 30 year old woman. I don't know the cause of death, but she's clearly dead. You need to get here as soon as possible. While he stayed on the phone, someone grabbed my face and began to squeeze and play with my expression. I didn't respond because I had no reason to. The dead don't care what others do to them. Still, one of my coworkers slapped away his hand. Don't do that, Larry. That's just so gross and disrespectful, he said. The people stopped touching me, but they still crowded around where I stood. I could still move, and it felt like I was breathing, but I didn't really feel like moving or talking. It was kind of peaceful, actually. I wouldn't have to worry about work, about having to get my mom grandkids, and I didn't have to worry about paying rent anymore. Death wasn't quite what I was expecting. I thought I would be unaware of what my body was doing, or at the very least I would be still and not moving. But no, I was still moving and breathing as far as I can tell, but I was certain that I would stop at some point. The only bad side to it as far as I could tell was the smell of that horrible perfume still in the conference room. When the vanguard arrived, they went to work immediately. The man began measuring my blood pressure and heart rate, and the woman listened to me breathing. After a few moments, they made notes on their notepad and spoke out loud. This is really weird. The heart rate is 60 beats per minute, and there's regular respiration and even blood pressure of 124 over 84, but she's very clearly dead, one of the vanguard said. She gestured to her co-worker. We should get her down to the mortuary. Go get the stretcher, she told him. I shook my head. I can walk. 
I finally said. The paramedics stare at me when I speak, but when I walk to the stairs, they followed me and led me to the ambulance. Once in, they lay me on the stretcher. Strapped down, they laid a shroud over me, but not before they left two coins on my eyes. One centi from the man and one centi from the woman. That way I had my fare for the ferryman. Still though, as I lay there, my eyes under coins and my entire body under the shroud, I breathed quietly. Waiting patiently, I couldn't help but hear. Have you even ever heard of a corpse that talked before? Let alone walk herself to the ambulance? But despite these words, I don't really care about this. Whether or not it was normal, it didn't bother me anymore. The problems of the living just don't concern me anymore. When we make it to the morgue, they wheeled me down into the mortuary. They left me with the mortician. When he removed my shroud, I could feel it moving away. The mortician sang himself when he removed the coins from my eyes, and I blinked in the sudden bright light. The mortician saw this, but unlike nearly everyone else, he kept doing his job. Clearly, he was about to leave. He pocketed the two centi from my eyes into his pocket and slid my body onto the slab. But before, before pushing the slab into the corpse fridge. Even though I was dead, I could still feel a twinge of upset when he took my coins. Now what was I going to offer Charon? As for my wallet, which he took all my denarii out of, I couldn't care less about that. Money had no real meaning for me anymore. But the coins were special. Still, no more need for food, no need for shelter, no need for entertainment, and soon I would be buried underground and become part of the earth. My consciousness would move on. Eventually. Still though, looking up at the slab above me, smelling the cold metal and the smell of refrigerated meat, I felt something twinge in my heart. My mother. She wouldn't get a chance to say goodbye. And lying here on the slab, it didn't feel right to leave her without any closure. So I pulled out my phone and sent a text message to my mother. Mom, I'm dead. I don't know how it happened, but I know for sure that I am dead. I just wanted to let you know that you are a fantastic mother. Even though I wasn't a perfect daughter, I want you to know I appreciate everything you did for me. Just know I'm in a peaceful place. I finish that last line and stare up in the middle above. Other than the sound of refrigeration, there was nothing going on here. A nice break from a life that was always running around. I remembered in middle school and high school I was always volunteering, always going to clubs, and as soon as I was old enough, I was working. My dad, he was always working. He never actually made it home and I don't even think he ever met me. He did some kind of tunnel work in Imperial City, and his contract was clear that he wasn't to be given any days off. But he sent us money often, so he must have loved me and my mom even if he never managed to contact us. My mom was also busy, but she also made sure I made it to my clubs and made it to my work on time every day. I remember graduating college in less than two days from starting my job at Isaacs Industries. I remember the warmth of the lights of the stage, the soft cotton of my dress, and even how tight my mom hugged me. That night, for the first time, it felt like I was standing taller than her. I remembered her beaming with pride, but also with tears of sadness in her eyes. And the words, she said, I am so proud of you, more proud than you can ever know, and you worked so hard for it all. But you need to remember that there's more to life than work. Remember to rest every once in a while. I don't want you to wind up like your father. Those last words confused me at the time. Mom always seemed to love Dad. 
She always looked at his picture every day. She often talked about what she would do with him as soon as his contract was up. She always spoke about how he was such an amazing man, but if he was working all the time, so if he was amazing, it must have been because he was working all the time. However, laying on the slab, I realized what my mother was actually trying to say. She meant to say that she missed him, and she didn't want to live the rest of her life missing her daughter the same way she was missing her husband. We weren't amazing because we were working all of our lives. We were amazing because we were a part of her life. But it was far too late to do anything about it now. I was dead and she was alive. Somehow that thought didn't bring me comfort. It only seemed to make me sadder. I laid on that cold metal for hours. I don't think I slept at all, but I didn't mind. It wasn't uncomfortable at all. My flesh didn't grow hungry, cold, nor restless. I was relaxed and, in a way, I felt like everything in my life built up to this piece. Something that I now realized I was sinking in my life. All my work, my projects, my mission, and my late night work. All of that stress was to reach this level of peace. When the morning finally came, the mortician pulled out my slab and standing next to him was my mother. Her eyes were red and blurry from crying and she was wearing all black, even wearing a black armband on her left arm, something I haven't seen her wear since dad died. When she saw my body, she covered her mouth, and the mortician took a step back. I'm sorry, is my body disgusting? I ask in an even tone, and my mom cries even louder. Her sobs shaking her entire body. The mortician is even more shocked, but at least he's able to speak. You're alive, he whispers softly. No, I'm not, I responded with confusion. Just yesterday, you placed me on the slab and took the senti from my eyes and my denarii from my wallet. The mortician turned red, and lucky for him, my mom was too focused on me to respond to what I said about the mortician's grave robbery. She slammed into me, hugging me close. My baby girl! I was so worried. I thought you were gone forever, but then I, I got your text last night. I, I had hoped there was a mistake, but everyone said that you were dead. I came down here as soon as I could, and now you're, you're still with us. She hugged me again, quite tight. After a while, I finally hugged her back. I felt something in that moment. I wasn't sure I recognized. After my mom finally let me go, she led me down to her car. She was insistent that we head to the hospital, but I was more confused than anything. I kept insisting that the only thing we should be doing is measuring me up for a coffin, or maybe an urn. Whichever was cheaper for her, I don't know why, but when I said that, she only cried louder and hugged me close. No, don't don't say that. You're, you're not dead. You're alive. We're taking you to a hospital to make sure that you're not hurt. Still, in the car, she was shaking too much to even hold her keys, so I offered to drive for her. She reluctantly let me. It was easy for me to drive. I didn't shake from the horns honking and I wasn't in a rush to go anywhere. Nothing really scared me because you cannot die twice. But I did want to make sure that my mom made it to the hospital okay. Surely the doctors would convince her that I was actually dead, not alive. In the emergency room, there was a long wait. No matter what my mom did to convince the nurse on duty to help us, the nurse didn't seem to care about us there. One would have thought that a dead body in the emergency room would have been an immediate concern, but clearly it wasn't. So we sat in our seats. 
My mom was clutching under my arm like I was going to disappear from her. When the doctor finally arrived, he escorted us to the medical room. He asked us what was wrong, so I spoke first. Well, doctor, as you can see, I'm clearly dead, but my mother here is in denial. I gestured to her. The doctor instead stared at me and said two words. Cotard delusion, he said solemnly as he spoke with my mom. It's been a few weeks since then. It took a long time for my mom to convince me that I'm alive. But it started by convincing me to shower and eat, just to make her feel happy. But as time went on, I started feeling alive again. Things started to feel like they could be warm and cold again, like things had dimension again. I even called my old job and convinced me to let them work there again. Do you know how hard it is to convince HR that you are actually sick when you leave early? It's a lot harder convincing them that you were dead, but you got better. When I finally made it to work, my desk was ransacked. Even my mug was taken. And I saw it with Larry from the black market department. He was drinking out of my drink me mug right in front of me. Larry, I swear if you're listening to this, I will get my mug back. As I organized what was left of my desk and files, I saw that my files from the robot body project were missing. So obviously, I went to check with my boss to see if he had the backup. When he wasn't in his office, I asked around and Larry said he was in the conference room. So when I made it to the conference room, my boss was still sitting in the same place as when we last spoke. When I asked him if he had the files, he just sat there, staring off into space. When I got closer, I could smell rot. His eyes were milky white and no sounds were coming from his body. No breathing, no movement, nothing. Standing back, I let myself look at him. Really look at him. What was left of my boss was more skeleton than skin. His suit was tattered and he had clearly been dead for months. But this didn't make sense. Endless projects were approved just in the last month. If he was dead all that time, how could no one notice? As I thought about it, a connection made sense in my mind. Whatever made everyone see me as a dead person must have made everyone see him as a living person. I call out to my coworkers as I pull out my phone. Hey, we have a dead body in here. I hear Larry call out when I say, when I said that, he said, not again. Elsewhere in Garden City, a woman with a blue bandana handed a flash drive to her boss. Her boss admired it for a moment before asking, are you sure this is the only copy? Mach 5 asked Shaker. Oh, I'm certain. They wiped the hard drives of any deceased employees and she was dead just long enough to wipe everything. Shaker responded. Mach 5 put the flash drive into her pocket as she wheeled her chair to her computer. So, what can you tell me about these hoplite class robots? Thank you for listening and you have a good rest of your evening.